You know, we've been talking about on Sunday morning in class, if you were here, about the seven great miracles in the book of John. <clears throat> we finished those up this morning. We'll have to, have to start on something else. But I want to I tell you something you probably never thought of, and I never thought of it myself until here, here a while back, and we were talking about something. I don't remember what it was, and I asked, talking about the day of Pentecost, and I asked, who provided the microphone? You know, you ever thought about that? It could have possibly been three million people there on the day of Pentecost. Now, envision in your mind how, how big an area would it take to, for three million people to, to stand if they were standing toe to toe and eye to eye? It'd take a humongous area. No speaker. I'm not speaking that loud here, but the microphone's kind of uh, ramping it up a little bit. They didn't have a microphone. And yet Peter stood up with the eleven and preached the gospel. And the Bible says that every man from every nation under heaven heard the gospel in their language. Can you imagine how many miracles that might have took? What a job that was for God to create something like that. Now, but we, we studied... <coughs> This morning we talked about God raising Lazarus, or Christ raising Lazarus from the dead. That was a, a large, a huge miracle. But to me, it seemed like to me that would have been a drop in the bucket to what we're talking about here on the day of Pentecost. All these people standing, I wouldn't be surprised what it wasn't a half a mile circumference. circumference. Or maybe more than that. Might have been a half a mile radius for all those people to stand. And yet every one of them heard the gospel preached in his own lang language. And I think if I remember correctly, there was some, uh, um, something like 11 different nations. Danny, you remember? Carlos or anybody else? Uh, that were listed as being there. And I think the Bible said something about every, every nation under heaven. Now, I may be making that up. I don't know. But I, I think I read something like that. But that was... That was some more miracle on that day. And <clears throat> top it all off, after Peter and the eleven stood up together and preaching, each one of them preaching, and, you know, I guess they probably, probably didn't know what they was preaching themselves. They knew, but they didn't, they might not, their voices may have sounded difficult because everybody heard it preached in their own language. But anyways, when he got round, down to it in conclusion, it's, it said, and I used to quote this, but I better. Verse 36, And then let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and asked the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? What's, what does that mean? What shall we do to be saved? They realized. And they had... Uh, they were told to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Why weren't they told you need to believe in Jesus Christ? You need to be willing to confess Christ as the Son of God. Well, the Bible teaches in three different ways. It teaches by direct command, by example, and by necessary inference. Now, two of those things, faith and repentance, faith and confession, they realized that they had killed, killed the Son of God. They believed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And by asking men and brethren, what shall we do? They were confessing to that. So, you know, it's kind of like if you're over on the other side of Athens and you're trying to tell somebody how to get, get to Decatur, well, that's going to be different. What you tell them there is going to be different if you're standing out here in front of this building, isn't it? When you say, oh, well, you go down here to 31, you get on that highway, and you go straight up, stay on it, you get to Decatur. Well, what they were told over there is going to be different. But yet, they got the whole message. They were told how to get here, and then once they got here, they, had, they could do what somebody was told out here what to do. Get on the road out here and go on, to, go on to Decatur. So here, two of these things are uh, a necessary inference that's inferred, faith and... and uh, well, confession. The fact that they had confessed to killing the Son of God. 
they believe they killed Christ Jesus, the Son of God. And so Peter told them, said, repent and be baptized. After they asked what we must do, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Now, the biggest part of the world today says that little word for means because you've already been baptized, you're saved, but you're, but you're being baptized after you're saved. They say that's what that means. But I, I know of no one in the world who would say in, <clears throat> in Matthew 20, 26, where Christ is instigating the Lord's Supper, when he gets down to the fruit of the vine, he says, this is my blood which was shed for many for the remission of sins. You ever heard anybody reject that and say that for meant because their sins were already forgiven and Christ shed his blood? No. You're never going to hear anybody say that. Well, the funny thing about it, the little word ace, E-I-S, which is used, translated for in Acts 2.38, is the same little word that's used twice in where Christ said, this is my blood, which was shed for many for the remission of sins. The little word ace is translated for there twice. Once in Acts 2.38. But people will argue till it turned blue in the face that baptism is not essential to salvation. But it is. That's, not, that's, on, that's only one passage that we could, we, we could consider. We don't have time to consider others. <clears throat> uh, uh, we know that sometimes there may be, may, may be someone here who needs the prayers of the church. Uh, maybe you feel like you've done some things that might, might not have been right in your life, and you'd like to make that right. Or is anyone that would love to be baptized? Sometimes we, we have those who feel like, and I've baptized several over the years who thought they, were, they didn't know what they were doing when they were baptized. He has to be baptized again. If we have anyone that fits either one of those descriptions, please come while we stand and sing.